Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, so we are just about to start our final evening of our Soapbox series event titled Infectious. Throughout this series, we have looked at methods how and how to transmit infectious diseases. We've had researchers talk about how you can communicate both about science but also about diseases and how do you create a world that doesn't stigmatize disease. And tonight, for our final evening, we are looking at the treatment of our diseases. For those of you who are unaware of how this evening works, you might notice it's gonna be a little different than most science talks you go to. For this evening, e each of our two presenters are going to have 20 minutes to share with you a bit about what they do, but also to share with you questions that they still think about and questions that keep them going and motivated in their field. After both of our presenters go, it is now your guys' turn to join the conversation. So as the audience, you will have chances to have discussions and conversations with your fellow table mates. Throughout these conversations, if a question comes up that particularly intrigues you, or you're wanting to get our experts to weigh in on it, you'll be able to send a tweet. We'll be passing out iPads with Twitter on it for you guys all to use. You'll be able to send a tweet in, and then after our discussion portion, our experts will come back up and then they'll have a chance to have a discussion with each other that is being influenced by your guys' tweets coming in. For tonight, we also have an online audience. Um, we're using a Google Hangout to transmit this to visitors and viewers at home. Um, and they will also have the opportunity to add comments and contribute through Twitter uh, to join in our conversation. Um, so with that, our first presenter for this evening is Professor Lee Gerke. He is a professor at MIT, and he works with um, medical engineering. Um, so let's have Professor Gerke up. Thank you, everyone. It's very nice to be here. Thank you for the invitation. So all of you who pick up your daily newspaper may have noticed that it seems like you're hearing more about infectious diseases these days. Uh, a couple of years ago, it was Ebola virus. Then uh, West Nile was in the mix. And most recently, of course, Zika virus. And um, it's not your imagination. <clears throat> you're definitely hearing more about infectious diseases. Um, this slide um, was taken in India but it shows some of the conditions that are giving rise to more and more infectious diseases. So some of the reasons why we're seeing more of these diseases that are coming out of the so-called sylvatic cycle, this is when the, the vectors, the animals that carry the viruses are still in the, the forests, the jungles, and then they come out and the viruses spill over into the human population. And that happens because of a number of different theories it could be deforestation, population growth, urbanization, uh, climate change. And some of the things that you see in this slide here <clears throat> are uh, unclean water, problems with sanitation, um, and uh, as I mentioned before, just overpopulation and urbanization. So this uh, image uh, was taken from the New York Times just a, a week or 10 days ago, and it's the perfect lead-in for what I want to talk to you about. It's a young woman who's having blood drawn in Florida, and um, she is concerned about whether or not she's been infected by the Zika virus. As you've all heard, Zika uh, has been circulating in, uh, in Florida, and the problem, uh, and I think the worried look on her face, which could be partly just due to the fact that she's getting blood drawn, but uh, she has concerns about whether or not she's been uh, infected uh, with this virus. And as the title says, these uh, tests can take weeks to come back. And, and so she's forced to uh, be concerned about this for a long period of time. And what we're trying to do is address this problem by having diagnostic tests that will return an answer within 30 minutes. So that's the goal of our work. 
And these are the three viruses that we worry most about. Uh, there are many pathogens in the world. There are bacterial pathogens, parasites. I'm going to talk to you tonight uh, about viruses. So the three viruses that we're most concerned about are dengue, Zika, and chikungunya, or as my wife in the audience would say, chikaboomba. Uh, the reason that these three viruses are so important these days is that they're co-circulating. That means that they're carried by the same mosquitoes, and those mosquitoes are illustrated here, Aedes aegypti, Aedes albopictus, and the really difficult part for clinicians is that when patients are infected by these viruses, they have very similar symptoms. They have uh, a rash, uh, a fever, uh, sometimes pain behind the eyes. Uh, uh, joint pain is very common. And even though these diff diseases are slightly different, for example, Zika has fairly mild symptoms, but it has a very bad rash that's very itchy. Uh, dengue uh, causes a quite high fever, some joint pain, but chikungunya causes really severe joint pain that can last for even months um, in patients. So the symptoms overlap. Uh, in areas of the world where they do not have diagnostics, the doctors try to look at their clinical symptoms, figure out what disease they have so that they're treated appropriately. But treatment for these is not very specific. There are no vaccines, although my colleague will speak about this right after me. Um, there are no vaccines, and the treatment is really pretty simple, uh, and that means keeping hydrated and watching the clinical symptoms, making sure the blood pressure doesn't go down. But other than that, there's not much more that can be done about these uh, viral infections. So um, this is a problem that has happened over the last 30 years, or it's gotten worse over the last 30 years, as is shown in this slide. On the top here in the map, if you look at the red colored areas, we're talking about dengue virus in particular in this slide. And what this slide shows is that where the red areas are is where there was a lot of dengue virus, a lot of uh, spread of, of the four different kinds of dengue. But look what has happened in, in 30 or 40 years at the intensity of the red color here. The number of cases has just exploded for the reasons that I was uh, telling you about uh, today. So this is the data that supports what I said before. It's not your imagination that you're hearing more about these uh, infectious disease. They are definitely more uh, prevalent in the world than they were uh, some 30 or 40 years ago. So this is a, a schematic of the kind of tests that we're trying to develop. Uh, there are many different ways to do diagnostics. There are ways to detect the, uh, the, gen the genomic information, the DNA or the RNA of the virus, a method that's called polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. There are ways that you can use serology to detect antibodies. These are uh, IgG or IgM tests. Um, the one that we're using detects actually a, a protein made by the virus itself. So this is a viral antigen test. And we're using a technology that's shown here. This is called lateral flow chromatography, or also called paper fluidic chromatography. And the best way to think about this is to think about a pregnancy test. Uh, it's essentially the same thing as a pregnancy test, where you have a sample pad where you could put uh, a body fluid, which could be blood or urine uh, or saliva or tears. Uh, can go on this pad, and then the liquid runs into what's called the, con the conjugate pad. And right here is what's illustrated is a gold nanoparticle. So these are very tiny uh, particles, about 20 nanometers in, in diameter. And connected to it is an antibody. So an antibody is a protein that recognizes the viral protein we're interested in. And so that gold nanoparticle then flows along here into this piece of paper here. And there's a negative control where we don't want to see signal. And then there are two other areas of the paper. One's called the test band and the positive control. 
and then just like you have in a, a pregnancy test, there are various kinds. Sometimes you see a, a, a plus or, or different kind of signal. You look to see if there is a positive result. In our case, it's a red band, which we can see with the naked eye. We don't need a reader. And it's because these gold nanoparticles accumulate uh, and they form a, a sharp band on the, on the test, and that's a positive test. The advantages of this kind of a test, it's very simple. It does not require special chemicals or any kind of special training. You can use just a few drops of blood on it, and ideally you can get a result within 30 minutes, uh, and the users don't need any kind of special training, and it can uh, be transported without refrigeration and uh, can be used, therefore, in, in austere environments. So this is the goal uh, that we have for trying to make uh, tests that will detect dengue, Zika, and chikungunya. So this is a problem in the field. So what I'm showing here is NS1 cross-reactivity in a dengue test. So NS1 is simply the viral protein that we detect. It's the viral uh, NS1 protein. And these are commercial tests. Each one of these is a, a test that's being sold um, in South America and being used for diagnosis. And one of the biggest problems with looking at dengue, chikungunya, and Zika is that at least dengue and Zika are closely related. And when you try to distinguish them, the tests cross-react. So imagine a woman that I showed you in the slide before wanting to know uh, if she has been infected by Zika, and the tests have a 50% probability of being positive for dengue instead. And that's what's shown in this slide here. So there are two bands on these uh, strips. The top one is the control band. The bottom one is the signal. This is a test for dengue virus, and this is a dengue virus sample, so that line there should be there. That's a good positive test. But as we go from uh, left to right here, we're testing a number of other related viruses. Japanese encephalitis virus, positive. It shouldn't be there. Uh, Usutu virus, this is a virus that uh, is being found in Europe now. Uh, shouldn't be there, positive test. Zika virus, a false positive. Uh, West Nile virus, false positive. Tick-borne encephalitis, also a weak false positive. Uh, yellow fever virus. Uh, also a, a, a positive. So this is the problem that we're facing in the field uh, and in the world is that these tests cross-react. What can we do about this? So this is the test that we're designing. Um, this is a prototype uh, that we're using and what we're trying to make is a multiplexed test. So what we want to be able to do is take one sample <clears throat> of blood or urine or, or serum and apply it to our test and be able to test for eight different pathogens, eight different viruses at the same time. So this will allow us not only to detect the virus that the person is infected with, but also rule out other viruses at the same time. So um, this is what my lab looks like uh, a, a lot of the time. Uh, we, we test. Uh, using single strips that the, what I showed you in the last slide was eight strips in one device. But a lot of times we just test them individually and we have these farms of tubes uh, on the lab uh, that are testing various antibodies and nanoparticles and so on. <clears throat> so I, I wanted to show you one uh, data slide. And so uh, this is uh, uh, testing that we did recently in Mexico. Uh, and so these are clinical samples. We've been able to obtain serum from patients um, in uh, Mexico. And the uh, reason for doing that is, is that, uh, and there may be people in the audience who have done field work, and what is very clear is that doing an experiment in the confines of your nice clean laboratory in Cambridge is very different than what happens when you get out and do an experiment uh, in the endemic area. And so uh, we wanted to test our, our, our uh, device under uh, uh, really uh, real conditions. And so these are some of the results up in the upper left-hand uh, corner here. 
This is a, t a test from a patient that had uh, dengue serotype 2. There are four serotypes of dengue. And so this is dengue serotype 2. And what I want you to see is that there are five strips here. Um, the second strip is the one that's supposed to light up if it's a dengue 2 patient. And the last strip here is, is one that picks up all four serotypes of dengue. So what we hoped to see was that these two strips lit up, and we, and we did. And there's very little um, cross-reactivity with the other strips that detect dengue 1, dengue 3, and dengue 4. This patient here um, is a dengue 4 patient. So you can see that there's a positive in the uh, dengue 4 strip, and also in the, uh, the, what we call the pan uh, dengue that detects uh, any of the serotypes. And then down here is dengue 1, and you'll notice that this is much fainter than uh, the other signals we're seeing. So what we believe has happened here is that this is a patient that was very early in the infection. So the viremia was quite low. The amount of the protein was quite low. But um, we were able to, uh, to pick it up um, nonetheless. And so we've done extensive testing with our uh, device. And we're pleased to say that we're seeing very little cross-reactivity with uh, the other uh, viruses. Uh, but we're still in the process of doing even more testing. And so uh, to do that testing, uh, uh, these are some of the places that we've um, visited recently. Uh, we've been, in the last few months, we've been to Mexico, we've been to Panama City, uh, two places in Colombia, and, and three uh, sites in Brazil. The testing for these devices has been challenging, and that's partly because the governments of many of these countries do not allow uh, patient serum samples to leave their borders. Uh, so we cannot just call our, co our collaborators uh, in Brazil and say, can you send me 100 um, serum samples? They cannot because their government will not allow it. And so we have just decided we will go to them. Uh, and fortunately, we have really terrific collaborators uh, there. But it's a, always a challenge when one is trying to move your laboratory to uh, a different country and do, uh, do experiments. So I'm going to leave you with three questions that, that uh, describe uh, things that we're thinking about. Um, and my first question is one that we think a lot about. Uh, and, and so you have seen what has happened with outbreaks, especially of Ebola and Zika. And there is a huge flurry of activity uh, that is uh, going on in a short amount of time. But eventually, the virus burns out, and then the headlines fall off, and then people tend to forget about it. The bad part of that is, is that I can assure all of you in this room that there will be another outbreak. And uh, our response to this point has been reactive. We wait until it happens, and then we try to do something about it. Our question is, how do we make it proactive? And the, uh, the suggestion that I, I will make here is that surveillance for these viruses is very important. So here's an example of a mosquito trap that can be used to uh, trap mosquitoes. And then we can use molecular techniques and other techniques to determine whether or not these mosquitoes uh, are carrying different viruses. That's an early warning system to know what's present. This is a hantavirus, which is uh, another emerging virus. If you've ever traveled to the western part of the country, you may have uh, been warned about hantavirus and hantapulmonary virus syndrome. It's actually very serious disease. About 30% of people who are infected die. And so we need better uh, surveillance to know uh, whether these rodents who, sp who spread the disease uh, are infected. Another one, we're thinking now about the countries who do not have the resources to buy these devices. The markets for the diagnostic devices uh, are in countries that do not have a lot of money. And the epidemics are, are unpredictable. They go away. And if you think about this in terms of, of a pharmaceutical company trying to make a profit, it's not a great model. So things that we think about is, uh, are there ways that we can have local production? Is there a way that we can make it possible for individuals in these endemic areas to make their own devices? And colleagues of mine uh, have run uh, 
um, uh, workshops in areas where they can uh, uh, assemble their own devices. This is actually for a TB device in Africa, uh, tuberculosis device in Africa. But even in, uh, in our own lab, we, we put together boxes that contain everything you need to make. In this case, this was an Ebola diagnostic. And then we can send it to our colleagues and they can test it. And the nice thing about having a component test is, is that if a new pathogen pops up, you can just swap in uh, different papers and now be able to detect the new pathogen. The last question is, what kind of technologies do we need for doing surveillance? It's labor intensive and it can be very dangerous. This is a, a mouse that's infected with uh, one of the hantaviruses. And it's really dangerous for people to do surveillance because if this mouse pees on this worker, uh, that individual has a very high chance of contracting the viral disease. So could we devise a way to do this testing autonomously without humans involved? And so right upstairs in this building with collaborators in IDC, we've built uh, a, what we call a smart, a smart mouse trap. So this is a trap that uh, uh, traps mice. It has a false floor that snaps up when the uh, um, uh, rodent enters. And then the rodent urinates. The, the urine flows down onto one of the test strips that we've, uh, I've just shown you. It runs the test. And then there's a little tiny camera in here that takes a picture of it. And with the wonders of very cheap electronics, that signal can then be transmitted to a, a site nearby to tell us that a rodent has been captured, the test has been run, and it's positive without ever touching the animal. Uh, another one is for mosquito uh, uh, detection. So this is a uh, device um, uh, that we have a prototype for that actually catches mosquitoes. And on the way in, it can identify what species of mosquito it is because mosquitoes have these little haltiers that they use for stabilization and it's, the species is specific for the vibration of the haltiers. So we can tell what kind of a mosquito goes in and it will count them and it will sort of phone home to tell us if mosquitoes have been captured and then instead of having an individual go to these things all the time to find the mosquitoes, we can know what's there and then collect them for further testing. So my last slide um, is, is one to, to leave you with a thought when you're on your vacation at, at Cape Cod, uh, relaxing um, and thinking you don't have to worry about everything, anything, but I want to tell you about Powassan virus, which is a, uh, related to dengue and Zika and West Nile. Uh, it's transmitted by ticks. You've probably heard of Lyme disease, and Lyme disease is a problem on the Cape. But this is a new virus that is emerging uh, on the Cape, um, and uh, it, it's, a, it's, it's an encephalitic virus like um, West Nile, and it's um, frankly being found in more ticks now than it has been before. So it's one that we're keeping an eye on, um, but something that we're always thinking about is the emergence of these new viruses. So I just want to acknowledge the people who've been in the lab and have done um, really uh, the, the work in our funding agents, and thank you all very much for your attention. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, as we are getting into our second presenter, um, I, we have a couple new faces who joined us during the first talk. Welcome. My name is Jennifer Novotny. I'm the Public Programs Coordinator here, and I'm very glad that you chose to join us for our final evening of our infectious soapbox. Um, for the audience, I have a quick poll. Have any of you been to our prior soapbox of this series? See a couple hands? Fantastic, welcome back. Really great to have you. Um, and for the rest of you, I hope you also are enjoying uh, this evening and this type of format. Uh, so with that, I'd like to introduce our second presenter. This is Omar Khan, and he is a research scientist at the Koch Institute. Thanks, Jen. I'm here to talk about, it's a perfect segue from Lee. What we do is that we make uh, rapid response synthetic vaccines uh, created through engineering design criteria. And before I start any talk, I always like to acknowledge the tremendously wonderful people I've had the opportunity to work and collaborate with. In particular, my uh, good friend, Jasdev Chahal, uh, who I work quite closely with. So 
no matter what, whenever you're infected, whether it be by some type of virus, let's do that again, whether it be some virus or parasite, once they get past your passive barriers, like your skin and the oil in your skin, if they get inside and they start replicating, you're the perfect place for them to grow in. And your body mounts an immune response. And when it does that, it fights back and to kill your infection. If successful, two important things happens inside your body. The first are these circular guys here. These are CDA positive T cells. They're also known as cytotoxic T cells. And what they do is they're great for killing active infection. The second thing that you need is antibodies. This gives you memory in case you're re-exposed in the future so your body can recognize that infection and prevent it from getting worse. So those are the two good things you need uh, when you resolve an infection. Now, vaccines, they're a powerful healthcare tool because they let you shortcut the entire infection event and get directly to your T cells and your antibodies. So how are these vaccines made? Well, this is an example of how we make flu vaccines. And this is actually really old, really mature technology. It's about 80 years old. And the way it works is that, well, first of all, I want you to notice this, the timeline, six to eight months to make a vaccine. Now, this begins with the prediction of what the next big virus is gonna be. That's because it takes so long to make these, you need to put down your bet. And hopefully you make the right choice because the lag time is so long. So you predict. Once you do your prediction, you take that virus and then you need to buy fertilized chicken eggs. And these are eggs that would otherwise hatch, turn into chickens, and you infect them with the virus. The viruses grow inside the chicken egg and all the liquid in the chicken egg gets loaded with virus. You crack it open and take that liquid, the allantonic fluid. You purify out and you have your virus. So basically you're using the eggs to grow your virus. Then there are two things you can do. You can take that whole virus and you can partially disable it and inject that as your vaccine. It's partially disabled so your body has a great chance of defeating the infection. And when it does that, it can get its T cells and its antibodies. So this is a bit controversial because there's a chance that they can revert to virulence. That means they can mutate and become virulent again and hurt you. So a lot of people are worried about that, but it is still the best form. Live vaccines are still the best form of vaccines we have. They are the most effective. As an alternative, what you can do is something called a subunit vaccine. So these are proteins. They are characteristic, almost fingerprint proteins that you would find on your pathogen. So you find those and you take those and you purify them out. And then you inject them along with some type of adjuvant to boost the immune response. And then you eject that, that's your vaccine. The idea is that when the immune system sees these antigen proteins, they'll know it's attached to something larger, pathogenic, and destroy it. So that's how it works. And this method, like I said, this production method has been around for almost 80 years and it works. It's saved countless number of lives. But as engineers, we have the opportunity to make this better. And in particular, we can really compress down these production steps because really what we need in the case, as you saw with least technology, if you can rapidly detect and diagnose a disease and you really wanna help people and prevent an outbreak, you need rapid response. And you can't get that with this much time lag. So the onus is on us to compress this and make it as fast as possible so we can react as quickly as possible to prevent huge outbreaks. So our concept is to make a preventative vaccine and we wanna use that, we wanna use ribose nucleic acid or RNA to do that. So we wanna use RNA to train the immune system to fight any infection. And this is the concept. We wanna take RNA and turn your body into the vaccine production factory. We want to decentralize production. Right now, production happens at some plant somewhere in the world, and they make a lot of vaccines. If you can decentralize that and make it happen at the point of care, you have much more reactivity. You can respond in a much more streamlined manner. So the idea is, going back to the antigen, that unique protein, if we can code that unique antigen protein into an mRNA and successfully deliver it inside your own cells, it'll associate with the ribosome, the ribosome will translate it and produce a protein. In our case, that's the antigen. 
then we can use that to raise an immune response. Now, there are a couple of companies that are really pioneering this type of technology. One of them is called CureVac, and they're in Germany. So they have these injections of mRNA, and that's how they use it. Turn your body into its own vaccine production factory to get your T cells and your antibodies. But there's still some challenges with this. Main challenges are you need a tremendously high dose, and you need multiple doses in order to get full immunity. And that could be a problem, because while you've compressed production and decentralized it, you still have the problem of patient compliance. Think about the developing world. Can you expect somebody to come back for six injections to get full immunity? That's not really feasible in some cases. So there is an opportunity to still make this better. So what we do is that we don't use conventional mRNA. We use self-replicating mRNA. And here's our process. We begin by identifying some pathogen. In this case, Ebola. So we identify a protein that is unique to that pathogen, our antigen, then we sequence it to find our corresponding mRNA for that antigen. We take that and we combine it with our blank replicon mRNA template. And this is the final construct. We call this bisestronic because it has really two genes. So there are two parts to this. The first half are instructions to make an enzyme for self-replication. Second half are instructions to make the protein antigen, which you're going to use to raise immunity. So if you can successfully build these replicons, the next step is how do you produce the vaccine? Well, this is where we come in. We make delivery systems. We use nanotechnology to create these delivery molecules, specialized compounds that form nanoparticles. They combine with our replicon RNA and some additional helper molecules. and to speed up the process, these are designed to self-assemble, which means they form vaccines instantaneously through mixing. At the end of that, you have your functional vaccine ready to inject. Once you have your vaccine injected into the muscle, nanoparticles enter the muscle cell, and here's where the trick happens. So here's our muscle cell. So you have your nanoparticles entering the muscle cell. Once it's inside the muscle cells, it uh, decomplexes and releases the replicon payload. So we have a replicon payload here, and because it's just mRNA, it associates with the ribosome, and the ribosome translates it. It makes the two proteins, the enzyme for self-replication and the antigen. Now the enzyme then goes on to make more copies of your self-replicating mRNA, which in turn get translated by more ribosomes. All the while in parallel, we're producing copious amounts of these antigens, which then get released. So in this way, we achieve self-amplification. So with just one small dose, not multiple doses, you don't expect people to come back, just one dose, you can get antigen production. And the best part about this is that it's temporary. So we can control the amount of time this happens. So we can tune it so that we have it for exactly the right amount of time to get your immune response. So it's safe. So your muscle cell releases the antigens and interacts with your immune system cells, and then we develop our T cells and our antibodies. So this is a schematic representation of one of those replicons. And replicons, they're actually the holy grail for our vaccination for quite some time. We've known about them for decades. And people have been trying to use this as a vaccination tool for all that time, but one of the challenges is that there's three, actually. The first is stability. These are so fragile that they'll degrade on their own, partly through autocatalytic degradation, where if they fold in on each other, they can catalyze their own degradation. The second is immunogenicity. If you're trying to inject this into your body, your body will have an immune response to it because every time your body sees foreign genetic material, it automatically assumes it's something pathogenic that's trying to kill you. It'll just destroy it. So even though we're trying to help the body, it won't see that and just destroy it. And finally, the size. A normal mRNA is about 1,000 nucleotides long. Replicons are at least 10,000, so it's tremendously large, and it's much more difficult to, to deliver. So the problem became, well, everybody knows this is the next thing, but how do we deploy this? So the challenge is how to design the best delivery materials for replicons and vaccination. So as an engineer, what would I do? I begin by having conversations. Talk to the people who would use your product and your technology. 
So this is a long list, but I'll touch on a few. First of all, when I spoke to clinicians, asked them what they wanted, one of the things they said is intramuscular injections because it has the opportunity to be self-administered. You can imagine air dropping this into an outbreak site and having people vaccinate themselves quite easily in a pen. Um, as engineers, rapid formulation. You want something that can happen on the span of days rather than months because we want to respond quickly. Biologists want to encapsulate this really interesting payload and immunologists wanted no immunogenicity. They wanted the material to be clean and not cause a material induced response. So this is my job is to take this list and convert it into chemistry and produce a nanomaterial compound that can get all this done. So it's a long list and the first thing that came to my mind was I need special chemistry to do this. And this is the type of chemistry that's not showing up, but anyway. This cartoon representation shows you what I do. So there are two really things, the two things I really need. The first is a core and a tail. And I can react those together to get my final compound. So the core is important because the core gives me charge. RNA is negatively charged, right? So I need something that can be positively charged so I can stick them together. That's the first step. So once I have collected all the RNA, I need to form a nanoparticle vaccine. And that's what these tails are for. So the tails help, they connect other molecules together so I can form a nice nanoparticle afterwards. So what I do with this is that I have a few engineering knobs I can turn on this. The first is the core generation size. So I can change the size of the core. This means functionally, I can change the charge density. So if I need a large, large charge density, I can encapsulate a larger negatively charged payload. So charge density is important. I need to control the tail length. So this tail length, these actually influence your stability. So just so you want to ship this out at four degrees Celsius, you want to make sure that your nanoparticles are stable at that temperature and not collapse out of solution or freeze out of solution. So this is how I can tune that property of the vaccine. And finally, the degree of substitution. So how many tails I put on this? So you can imagine that with these amounts of tails versus this, these have more opportunities for your RNA to get inside and see the charge called steric hindrance. So we wanna make sure that we have the opportunity for the RNA to access this. So what I can do is that I can use a variety of chemistry to make a plethora of different materials to actually tune this to get the right type of material. And I went through that, and this is the final material that we came up with through extensive testing. So it has these N groups, these nitrogens, these are called amines, amine residues. What's cool about these is that if you put them in an acidic solution, they temporarily become positively charged, and then I can stick on my negatively charged RNA, and then afterwards, I have these large carbon tails, and these help stick all of these molecules together to form a nanoparticle. So that's how we get self-assembly. Self-assembly grabs the RNA, and then they grab each other with the tails to form the nanoparticle. So this graph shows stability. So this nanoparticle, over time, started off stable, then degraded and fell apart. Our lead material here started stable and stayed stable. So that's good, that's one of our design criteria. This shows vaccine function over time after storage. So this shows that the function, the activity of the vaccine remains constant over our storage period. Now remember, the two good things you want from any vaccine is T cells and antibodies. What this graph shows is that we made a model vaccine, vaccinated animals, and then we looked over time and saw that we got a really wonderful T cell response. And remember, this T cell response is, should be prolonged and protracted, and that helps you get durability in your immune response. So we got our good T cell response, so perfect. The second thing we needed was antibodies, and what this graph shows is again, we made our RNA, a model RNA replica, formed a nanoparticle vaccine, vaccinated the animals, and you can see that depending on the dose size we use for the vaccine, we can get increasing amounts of antibodies in your blood. So perfect, we got our T cells and we have our antibodies. Now let's go play. So this is just a comparative graph to show you how this works against different technologies. 
So the potential for allergens and contaminants with this type of fully synthetic system is very low because remember, everything is done on the bench. We don't use fertilized eggs, we don't use cells, nothing. So there's nothing to purify out, no cross contaminants. That means purification is very easy. Production time, one week versus six to eight months. Huge advantage. Is it on demand and scalable? Because remember, we want to decentralize production, but then if an outbreak site needs more vaccine, can we do that? Yes, we can. You just mix more of it together. That's how it's scalable. And cost, right now we're at about, for a single dose vaccine, about $8.50 per dose. We're working to bring it down because it should be, you know, much lower, especially in the developing world. But, you know, with the economy of scales and as engineers, we can work on that. So with all this, one of the first things we went after was H1N1 influenza. And there's a, a particular reason for this. It's, a, it's an influenza, and in 2009, it caused a pandemic. And the reason for the pandemic is that we didn't have enough vaccine to control it because there weren't enough fertilized eggs. So we said, could we build H1N1 vaccine in seven days as a proof of concept? So we focused on the outside of the virus. That has a protein on it called hemagglutinin. So we chose that as our antigen. So we programmed hemagglutinin into their RNA, formed a vaccine, vaccinated animals, and this is called a survival curve over time. How many animals survive over time? So animals receiving a control vaccine all succumb to infection, but animals that have received our vaccine, 100% survival. So it's great. We know this works for H1N1, and we know we can do it in a week. The next thing is, let's look at something more complex, a parasite. In this case, we looked at Toxoplasma gondii. Not many people know about this, but you may have heard of it recently in the news. There's a drug that people use for that, and then um, a company really raised the price on that drug, and then everybody got really upset, rightfully so. And so we said, can we make a vaccine for this? Because there is no vaccine for this. And part of the reason is, like malaria, this parasite has two forms, an active and a dormant. So when it's in its active form, your immune system can fight it, but then it hides in its dormant form, and then it goes quiet, you can't deal with it. And then it comes back in its active form, and then hides. So it's really difficult to treat. It actually infects one third of the world's population, so, and if you like rare meat, you're probably in that third. So um, it's, it's a huge problem, and um, they often live as in cysts in your brain, and that's why when older people uh, have a chance of getting dementia from this sort of thing too, so that's cerebral toxoplasmosis. It also shows up in immunocompromised individuals, so, and there's no approved human vaccine. So the nanoparticle system that I designed has tremendous payload capacity. That translates into versatility. So I know that there are two forms, the active form, the tachyocyte, and the dormant form, the bradyocyte. So what I said was that, okay, how about it can, is it possible for us to simultaneously vaccinate for the active and the dormant form? So train the immune system to see both forms. So what Jess, Dave, and I did was that we made replicons that would cover us for both the active and the dormant form. So we made all these replicons and we formed what we call a multiplex vaccine. Vaccinate our animals and then expose them to lethal, uh, lethal exposure to the, to the parasite. And animals receiving the control vaccine also come to infection. And these that received vaccine, 100% survival. And what's really great about this is that, you know, this time point here, around 30 days, this is the critical point where all the dormant uh, parasites that are in cysts in your brain, they become active again. And if they're active, then they should start killing. And you can see that we don't have that drop off up to, you know, these animals are still alive actually. So they're uh, BAR, bright active responsive. So, this is great. Now we have the ability to hit influenza, we can do parasites. And another thing we looked at was Ebola. Can we do this? So we all know it's a terrible disease. It actually has a 90% mortality rate for the Zaire version. But on the outside of Ebola, there's a protein called glycoprotein. So that is our antigen target that we picked. So we worked with my good friend, Chris Cooper at US Amarid, and we made programmed our RNA to express glycoprotein, formed a nanoparticle vaccine, vaccinated animals, and then exposed them to Ebola. And again, all these animals, they received the control vaccine, died, and our animals are completely asymptomatic. 
complete serum sterilization. They just, the immune system completely cleared the infection and they didn't even, they didn't even sneeze. So with that, it's kind of, we have the ability, we're building the ability to actually detect things a lot more quickly. But without the ability to respond quickly, they go hand in hand. So we have to make sure that we are developing both sides of te technology. So rapid production synthesis, we can make pure vaccines and faster response times, and this is how we fight outbreaks. So with that, I kind of have a few open-ended questions that we are struggling with as we take this technology out into the clinic. How do we deal with this? So these vaccines are prophylactic, which meaning you vaccinate someone to protect them. So you, you're treating an otherwise healthy person. And the FDA regulations say that if you vaccinate someone who is healthy, it, the onus is on you to make sure they don't get sick for the rest of their life. So they've tied that into their approval process where they say that if you vaccinate somebody, you track them and throughout their lifetime to see if they're okay. And if they are okay and they die from other causes, then you know your vaccine is safe. That makes sense from a safety point of view because the FDA's primary objective is to protect people and we can't fault them for that. But now we have this duality here that we need rapid response. So this type of regulation becomes difficult. So keeping safety in mind, how can we use this type of rapid response technology to take advantage of rapid diagnosis, right? How do we safely, ethically, and responsibly update what we do in terms of the FDA regulations to enable these types of technologies to actually help people? So thank you for your attention. Have a good day. Fantastic. So at this point, both of our presenters, I think, have left us with plenty to start thinking about. And so now, of course, it's the tough part for you guys. You've heard two wonderful presentations, both of which I think call into question a lot of things about how science needs to be very interdisciplinary in order for us to incorporate a lot of these technologies. We also need to think about things beyond working in a laboratory. How do you make sure these things are able to be deployed in the field? How do you get the serums to test your technology? And so I think we have a lot of great things as a group to discuss. For us, we are gonna be passing around these iPads. All the iPads are open to Twitter, so that way if you don't have your own Twitter account, you will be able to contribute to our ongoing Twitter stream. One very important note, though. You must include the hashtag MIT Soapbox, or we will not see your tweet. If you look on your table, there are these little uh, pieces of paper, little sandwich tents, that also say the hashtag. Um, so I'll be pulling up the Twitter stream on this so you can see what other groups are talking about. But remember the hashtag Hashtag MIT Soapbox. Hashtag MIT Soapbox. You guys have about 15 minutes to discuss in your groups, and then we'll come back together for a small group discussion. Enjoy. One of the questions, two of the questions up here, and I think some of the conversations I heard, were looking at the FDA approval process for these types of things. And I think both of you might be able to weigh in both in how does your testing become an approved, appropriate test for this type of thing? And for you, how would your vaccines actually reach the market? Mm -hmm. um, so I think you both could weigh in. You can choose who gets to go first. Mark, paper, scissors. Rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> <laughs> One, I don't know. I, I'm happy to start because it's something that we are, are um, thinking about a lot um, these days. And, and I want to preface it by saying that we definitely want the tests that we have to be safe and, and uh, effective, but um, getting them through the uh, regulatory process uh, in the US is, is challenging, but we're also thinking about how to get them uh, to people in uh, Central and South America. So every country has its own process. And um, there is no uh, uh, document that gives you step-by-step that says, if you do this, 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 and this, 
you will have your approval at the end. And so that is hugely problematic for us because we want to do the testing that is appropriate and, and required, but it's like we don't know the rules in advance. The samples are really precious. So what we would like to have is something that says, here's what you need to do. We know in advance, we'll get the samples and we'll do it, but it's been challenging to get that. John, can you? So just a, a naive question. I was, it's so, sorry, <clears throat> thank you. Just a naive question. It's so striking to hear you say that every different country has its different rules and you, may, you have, it could be very slow. Wouldn't it be in countries' self-interests to uh, group together and nominate some agency to, to, to have a standard set of guidelines and, and regulations so that developers like you who are producing use, potentially useful new uh, diagnostics or treatments could go to one place and get permission which all of these countries would then accept. I mean, there's like a win-win for everybody there. I don't understand yeah. why that wouldn't happen. Yeah, I, I think that makes perfect sense. Um, unfortunately, though, if you look at the areas and the political situations in, in Venezuela, in Brazil, um, now in Colombia, um, it's, I, I think they're kind of, they're focused on other things and right. this is, yeah. Not, but what you're saying makes great sense, and, and it would be uh, very helpful to us if that happened. Yeah. yeah. So. Like World Health Organization do something like yeah, WHO. Yeah, uh, I have to say that our experience with WHO has not been great. Um, they have their own way of doing things in their own group of people that they like to do things certain ways and. Um, it's been hard to break into that, and um, so that, um, the, the other thing with WHO is, and we found this when we, we also have an Ebola device, and, and when the outbreak happened in West Africa, we tried to uh, do some testing there. WHO is, is interested in a device that is ready to go in a box and can be shipped. We are interested in co-creating, co-inventing, hacking uh, with the people in the endemic areas. And so that our model doesn't quite fit with what they want, and that's been a challenge for us. I think uh, part of the problem also is um, momentum. A lot of the traditional diagnostics and treatments have been the same way for such a long time. So all your regulations are built around a very specific idea. So when you do something disruptive, then it's completely radical and different. So the, the burden, the activation energy to get something through is tremendously high. Yeah. But to the FDA's credit, um, they recognize that they're just catching up with DNA vaccines, and which is a different type of nucleic acid. It has more of a risk because it can integrate into your genome and cause mutations and cancer. But um, when we were speaking to them about our progress uh, towards the clinic, they said that the only path for you is to work with us one-on-one. -on -one. And together, we will develop the regulations together. So it's a conversation for them as they figure out how to move things forward. But um, it's interesting because Lee's right, I mean, and you're right, uh, depending on what country you talk to, they're like, we have very lax rules, come here. Um, but then it's, it's tricky. Um, a good example is Japan. They had a, a vaccine for their seasonal cherry blossom uh, allergy. and. It was a DNA vaccine, no one would touch it in North America. But it was such a great need in Japan that they said, you know, we'll, we'll give it a shot. And it worked relatively well. And they used that data from Japan to translate it over to America and saying, look, not many people mm -hmm. died. How about we do this for a different application in America? They're like, okay, we'll, we'll piggyback off that data. So there are ways in which people have been looking at doing this. But again, how do you do it ethically? That's the big question. I was just thinking about the other companies in certain countries and how they develop their vaccines or their medications and whatever, I guess, agencies they go through in order to mass produce their, their drugs or whatever. Uh, are you able to communicate with those people and see how they get their things through, or is it the same? So, so we're, we're trying to do that. Um, what, what we're finding in many cases is that it's, 
you, 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 have to, you just have to know the right people to talk to. And in many cases, the regulatory agencies, I guess this is true of the FDA too, but they're closely linked to the government. And you, you, you have to make everything happen together. So finding that right person is key. And I, I think that's the stage that we're at right now. That's also making the technology as easy as possible really helps, especially in terms of production. Because if you have something that can be you know, readily assembled that's modular, or that can be assembled at the point of care, that usually helps and kind of, uh, one of the bears is always production. How do you decentralize this? How do you make it so anybody can do it? And that once the accessibility, just that, that it's like the cell phone. In developing the developing country, everybody has a cell phone, no one has a landline. So it's the same idea, you want that mobility, that portability, that uh, democratization almost <coughs> of, of your technology. With that, one question that comes to me, both of you have talked about the ease of assembly, being able to ship it. You even talked about the price point. What is the price point that would make something like this actually viable? Do you guys have a number, or is it as low as you can go is sort of your goal? You go first. <laughs> uh, so it depends on your market. Uh, yeah. For North America, your price point is almost whatever you'd like it to be. As long as it works, you can get it you could, you're very likely to get it as a line item and reimbursement for insurance. So as long as you show up, you can see. And when it comes to the developing world, you need it to be extremely inexpensive. If you can make it pennies, that's what you want to do. Um, so there's uh, a lot of barriers because there are a lot of ineffective treatments out there that are very inexpensive. But because they're very inexpensive, they've swamped like, the market, and even though they don't work. So, Convincing people that your technology actually does cost a little bit more is, is difficult for some people to, to grasp. So um, re reducing the burden and by that having someone, if you can just ship out stable modular components that people can put together on their own, that offsets the cost and that really helps things out. So uh, a lot of models that many companies are, are doing now is um, to make it financially viable is to have larger holding companies that have the idea that you know um, your core technology is held here and then you have all these different sub companies that handle each different disease and um, those diseases can be maybe specific or more prevalent in some country and they can be you know they can operate on lower margins because you know they're they're doing something for the good of people you know altruistic and they get government assistance that sort of thing and um, then you can make it up by charging more in a more developed country a developed world uh, scenarios to kind of offset that. So there's a lot of like shuffling and, and kind of subsidizing it and that seems to be one of the, the major models to make it work because our goal has always been to get cheap vaccines out to the developing world as Lee's has always been, you know, we want everybody to have access to good diagnostic technology so you can get the treatment you need and you do have to shuffle the deck a bit and just like kind of even it out. That's kind of what we have to do now. Yeah, I, I agree with the way you put it, Omar. And knowing what the price point is, I've asked this question at conferences I've gone to, and it's, it's very hard to nail down what it is, even with the insurance people in the, in the room. Yeah. <clears throat> so we, we know that for our test, $20 a test is too much, way too much. Um, but that's what a PCR test uh, costs in a lot of cases right now. So the cost that we have for our strips right now is about $5. Um, it can be a lot less than that because um, when you scale up, um, prices go down. We can make our own particles. We're buying them right now, things like that. So the price can, can come down a, a lot, but determining what that magic number is is, is hard. Wonderful. Um, so another question that we have from Twitter, I think this is more directed towards you, Omar, is does the nanoparticle vaccine approach work as well as a therapeutic if the virus is already present? Um, so yeah, there's an opportunity to, for it to work as a therapeutic as well. Uh, a good example is our cancer variant. So what we were looking at were um, antigen targets that show up on late stage tumors and we vaccinated against those. And we were able to prevent those tumors from forming, um, but uh, from growing out. But early stage tumors did not show those antigens. So the early stage tumors form, grew, but once they became old and mature, then they presented this antigen, 
and then the immune system could attack it. So in that, in that context, it is a therapeutic because you're treating something that's already there. And it's the same idea behind the, our, our desire to hit Toxoplasma gondii because you know, fighting off the dormant cyst, you already have that infection. Then when it switches over to the active form, then you can fight it, but then you can also go back and fight the, uh, the uh, dormant form of it as well. So uh, yes, there is opportunity to work with it, but um, prevention is always the best medicine. So that's why we've kind of narrowed down our focus on that because a lot of people, uh, a lot of things can be treated chemically uh, so you can put in, for example, for viruses, antiretrovirals or something like that to help treat it. Um, but if you can prevent the infection to begin with, that's kind of where this technology focuses on. But yes, we can, we do have the opportunity to use it as a therapeutic. Fantastic. So this next set of questions, I think, can combine a couple together. So there's been the question about, is, has there been a rise in infectious diseases in recent years, or is there an increased awareness of com and communication? But I also think that could tie in well with why have dengue and other tropical diseases spread out of the tropics? I think those two might be paired together. Do you want to take a stab yeah, at it? Um, okay, so there, there are several steps in, in this process. So there is the so-called sylvatic stage of these diseases, and there are so many pathogens um, in the so-called sylvatic, which is the forest or the, the, the jungle environment um, that we have not, we don't know anything about that are just sort of lurking there. Um, so what happens then is that there is a point reached when those pathogens leave the sylvatic uh, stage and then enter into a, an animal vector or a human phase. So let's ask that question first. So is the rate of, of leaving the sylvatic stage into the animal vector or human stage increasing? I would say yes, it is. Um, and the evidence for that is uh, look, at, look at what happened with Zika. So Zika was uh, first discovered in 1947. The first human case was found in 1952. And then it kind of went quiet for uh, a long time. Um, and then suddenly exploded in, in the fall of 2015 in, in Brazil. That was very likely due to one of these spillover events, but then travel. So travel has increased so much. Uh, travel and shipping are probably responsible for transmitting uh, a huge number of these. So you can even follow the movements of viruses by overlaying them on uh, travel routes, airplane routes. Uh, to different cities. And so uh, the advent of being able to travel anywhere in the world in 24 hours um, has definitely uh, enhanced the, uh, the spread of these viruses. So I, I think the, the deforestation of the uh, climate where you're disrupting the environment, I think the data suggests that if you disrupt an environment, you are increasing the chances of getting one of these spillover events when you get a virus that's going to come out of a, uh, a non-human primate or a bat uh, and enter into the, uh, the, the human cycle. And then after that, travel takes over. I think um, we are also working on a Lyme disease vaccine. And um, if you uh, look at the literature and you can actually overlap the spread of Lyme disease, correlate that with the temperature rise mm. uh, for global warming. So you can actually see that Lyme disease is actually spreading more and more north. Now it's creeping into more of Canada from like a uh, more central part of the eastern seaboard of America and it's just moving up and it's just the climate has changed. So then that could breed in a much wider area and spread and it's, it's actually really amazing because uh, seeing how climate change affects everything including the progression of disease is just um, just staggering to see something like that happen, but I think that's uh, just adds to, to, to Lee's points that you know uh, a, lot, a lot of these things are maybe we're doing, <laughs> we're definitely doing. If you guys are more interested too in how these diseases are spreading, our first talk of the series was on transmission. We had Carolyn Bucky of Harvard who has developed a way to look at the spread of diseases by monitoring cell phone data. Mm -hmm. uh, so we do have that on our YouTube channel, so you guys are welcome to check that out as well. It looks like we have time for one more question. Do we have any from the audience? 
fantastic. Hmm. So how do they link together so before they are degraded in the lysosome? So it's um, a proton pump mechanism. So there's a large buffering capacity in the nanoparticle because of the amine groups. So the endosome tries to change its pH in order to process whatever's in there. Because um, it can buffer out those pH changes. It just starts dumping in more ions. I keep buffering them. And then as it tries to put in more ions, it's bringing in uh, solvent with it, which in this case is water. And it just swells the endosome, pops it, and the nanoparticles get out. And then they can release their payload, and then we're good to go. Is, is, are you saying it's an osmotic process, essentially? Yeah, it's, it's endosomal. It's like a proton pump mechanism. That's, right. yeah. Oh, yes. And how does the replicon stop replicating? Or how does the protein production get so limited? We, can, we can actually control that through architecture. So. Uh, my colleague, Jasdev Jahal, who I, I work with on developing this technology, he's the replicon payload side and on the delivery side. So what he does is that there are these two N regions called the untranslated regions of the mRNA. You can tweak those, and by doing that, you can actually change the kinetics of production as well as how long they live. So that's how we can actually tune to get whatever kinetics you want out of the system. Fantastic. Um, would each of you care to share maybe a last little 30 second view of what you see the future of disease treatment to look like? Sure, sure. I, 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 I just wanted to comment on, on Omar's great work and, and say that this, I, what you're doing, I, I think dovetails so nicely with what we're trying to do in, in thinking about how do we become proactive instead of reactive. So by doing, uh, being proactive, we would like to do more massive scale surveillance. So we want to be able to detect these spillover events very early on. But in the long run, we're not going to be able to proactively make a vaccine for every possible virus. There are so many of them and that would be so expensive. But if we can get early surveillance, then I think we can say, we can get a rapid vaccine to, once we get the data to say that we should keep an eye out for myorovirus or, or whatever, then your technology can make a, a rapid vaccine. And, and I think that would be a so much faster response and make us proactive rather than reactive. I think the, the next big step in healthcare is decentralization. Um, having people respond locally to what they need and giving them a platform that will not only let them detect what's in their local environment, but then produce a tailored vaccine at the point of care. That's, that's where I see the future being. Um, not waiting for some specific region in the world to turn on their plant and decide your disease is important enough or lucrative enough for them to make a profit on, but rather someone saying that I have the platform, I was able to detect it, I have the platform, I have the tools here to make what we need here. Giving the world that capability is tremendously important, and I think the democratization of healthcare is the most important thing. Fantastic. Thank you both so much. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> a pleasure. Thank you. Excellent. I hope you all have had a wonderful time here tonight. I really appreciate you choosing to spend your Wednesday evening with us. Um, there have been some surveys on the tables. I see some people filling them out really quickly. Uh, so as you guys, if you can get those filled out and added to our silver bucket, um, we will be doing a drawing for a wonderful prize. The winner of our random drawing is going to get two free tickets to our next event here at the MIT Museum. We are doing How to Make a Superhero. Uh, so this is one of our favorite formats. We will be speed geeking throughout the museum. We have five experts, so you and a group of friends will move from expert to expert throughout the evening, learning about some of the science of superheroes. So we will be exploring their gadgets, their materials, and a bit about the psyche of superheroes. Um, this is a 21 plus event, but the winner will win two free tickets for this event. Does everyone have their surveys in? Last call, because I hear two more. 
going to fold them so they're all equal. <laughs> Excellent. We will have Omar do the honors if you want to give it a little stir around. The pressure's on. Fantastic. And the name is, it looks like Zoe. Zoe? R-E? Re? Anyone? <laughs> Does this sound like anyone who might have questionable handwriting with a very short name? Going once, going twice, we are drawing again. Second time's the charm. <laughs> All right. Third time is actually the charm. No name. Oh, my goodness, you guys. <laughs> All right. Maybe you should try drawing. We're going to pass the luck on. Right? Maybe you should have picked her name, then she could have won. Thomas Zahn. Thomas. Congratulations, and thank you all, and I hope you have a lovely evening. If anybody wants to continue this conversation, um, we're going to head next door to Nako Taco, grab some beverages, a couple snacks, and keep chatting. So hopefully we'll see you guys over next door as well. Thank you. Have a good evening.